The Gulf Injustice Podcast, the official podcast of Detained in Dubai with Raga Stern. A Scottish construction engineer who was detained in Iraq for over two months on the back of a Qatar-issued Interpol red notice for debt has finally returned home. He arrived in Edinburgh last Saturday and it was quite a traumatic time for him. So we're going to have a little chat with him and find out what the prison conditions were like. He was quite concerned to speak out while he was detained. So it'll be good to know uh, exactly how Iraq treats people in prison. He was in there with another man, Hussein, a Lebanese national, who was also wanted over a Qatar bank debt. So this is a frequent occurrence. And we're looking to, at the end of this, once Brian's had a chance to recuperate and spend that time with his family, we're looking to take some sort of action to make Interpol accountable for having British nationals repeatedly locked up abroad. So let's have a look firstly at Brian's re reunion with his family back at Edinburgh Airport on Saturday, an emotional time. <laughs> And now let's bring Brian on the Gulf Injustice podcast. Hello, Brian. Good to have you. Good to have you home. And uh, so happy that you've, you know, had a chance to relax and, and now you're a bit more ready to talk about what happened to you. So welcome back. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, it was obviously, I just wanted to get this interview done, but when I first came home, I didn't, I was a bit numb, eh? I still am a bit numb, to be honest. It's all a bit strange and surreal, but a day at a time I'll get there, I suppose, but um, mm. it's just, it's still not really hit home, I don't think, eh? Mm, yeah, it's going to be bizarre for a while, I think. Um, but why don't we go back to the beginning anyway? Why don't you describe basically what happened when you arrived in Iraq? I mean, we, we've heard it from your family, but we haven't heard it from you. Um, so basically, I took a job there to as a construction manager, which was the next level up I could probably go. And I was, I was, I was, I was buzzing for it. I was like. Great ch a chance and go and earn some good money and start thinking of the future for my, my kids and my grandkid and thinking about uh, obviously ten years down the, down the line I could retire sort of thing. So I was mm. really I couldn't wait to get there and there was a friend of mine that I worked with previously that kind of helped get me in there. So I was I was over the moon. I was delighted and. Um, as it got closer, obviously, that I got a bit nervous to the fact that oh, it's a, not not for anything other than I was stepping up the ladder a bit in my career, and I thought, mm. am I biting off more than I can chew here? But I still, I went, I, went, I remember, I can still remember it, the, the weekend before, I went on the Saturday or the Sunday, I think it was, I left. The Sunday I left, uh, Sunday the 12th or 11th, it would have been, I left uh, Glasgow Airport, but before that, my wife was away, was heading to a dance competition with my daughter down in Alton Towers, or uh, Blackpool, I think it was, on the Thursday, Friday morning. So that was the last I seen them, and it, was, it, it wasn't it was the goodbye I wanted. It was like, I wanted to be with them the weekend, but it was just the way it worked. So anyway, I said bye to them, and I, uh, 
I was picked up went away at the airport on the, the Sunday morning with my father, dropped me off, flew to Dubai, uh, got off at Dubai. I had a wait there for maybe four or five hours in the airport. And then I met up with a, a guy that was going out in the same job as me uh, at Dubai at the connection flight to, to Basra. Obviously, he was sitting on a different bit of the flight. He'd been there many times before, and he kind of made me a bit comfortable about what I had to do with my visa. But I, I was, I was still, I was, I was a bit tired by then with the waiting and the, the flight. But I was still just eager to get there. And then I landed in Basra, and I was kind of aware of what it'd be like. I've travelled the world before with jobs, and. Um, it's no places you go on holiday, so I knew when I landed there, it wouldn't be a normal international sort of airport, so it wasn't much an airport. I got met at the visa bit uh, when I got off the flight by a, a person through the company I was going to work for, or like a fixer, and they, they took my passport. I sat and waited, but that was all just normal practice, so as I'm sat there, I managed to con contact Kimberley and just drop a message back home saying, look, I'm here, I'm in Bajra, I'm just waiting on my, my visa. So I gave them the money for my visa and then uh, they came through and shouted my name. Uh, I went through, obviously, went, got my passport, my visa was in it, it was stamped. And before I even left to go there, four or five weeks before, I got a, a signed uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, I think it is, from Iraq, four different signatures to say that I was able to travel to Iraq. Mm -hmm. So... Even that on its own, I thought, eh, still, well, everything's good to go. So I got my passport handed to me, my visa in it, it was stamped. I thought, oh, great. And then there was just a wee wooden shack a booth, if you like, with a guy standing there. And the boy in front of me went, and he was 30 seconds, looked at his passport, away he went. I went, and then he looked at my passport, and I looked at the computer, looked at my passport. And it was taking a wee bit longer than 30 seconds, and I was starting to think, what's the kind of going here? And he says, one minute, and he went away. And I seen him coming back from this door with, with two rather uh, important-looking people at the time with, with suits on, and a bit like, the way I can remember it, it was a bit, a bit like, um, remember, like uh, Don Johnson in the Hawaii... <laughs> A bit like that with the shirt unbuttoned and the suit and the yeah. shades on and the two of them came up and they've all got my passport looking at this computer and then they start laughing and pointing at me and oh big trouble, big trouble. Ooh. So by this time my heart's jumping out my chest. Yeah. And I'm like, What's the problem? And they're like, Oh, big problem. And they started saying stuff like, You've got packages in your bag from uh, Dubai and I'm like I started thinking there's somebody got my bags and put something mm. in it. Mm. So then they says, come, and they just marched me from there into this wee side room, which was, it was, all right. it was, it was like a, a tea sort of room that they would maybe sit in, uh, and there was all people coming and going, not, they didn't look like any important people, just people that maybe, they looked like cleaners for the airport, if you like, eh? and they're mm. all sitting in, oh, big trouble, you've got two kilograms of cocaine in your bag, and I'm like, What? But the, the the whole the whole um, communication the, was so was you, you had you had literally no idea why you were being no. arrested. You thought someone might have got hold of your bags or put something yeah. in there, like you see in the movies. Yeah, and then I started. I'm like started getting frustrated because this was like an hour had passed, and they're coming in, and they went into a side room. I don't mm. know what was in there. I take it it was a desk or something, a computer. And we'd come out there again with my passport, a different person each time. Tell us what your problem is. You've got problem in Dubai. I'm like, give me your other passport, your second passport. I said, I, don't... I says, look, what's going on here? I said, I don't have another passport. You have yeah. another passport. You're hiding it. <laughs> I said, I don't have a passport. I says, that's the only passport I have. And then I showed them this uh, letter of invitation. I think it was called. It was all signed. And, uh, I yeah. showed them all the paperwork for my job. Yeah. He says, don't worry about that. You're not going there. You've got a bigger problem. And it must have been about two two hours had passed and then this door just opens and two police officers come in and mm. they move, put handcuffs on me. Still didn't know what it was for, eh? Marched me through the, the airport 
to get my bags. So I'm trying to pick these bags and pull these bags with handcuffs on, suitcases, and they take me out to this car. And I, I'm like, what? I said, where am I going? They're, they're just sitting laughing at each other driving this car. And I'm thinking, this time my backside's collapsed there. I'm like, what's wow. going on? I so mean, you must have, I mean, what was going through your head? You must have been thinking, oh gosh, I'm going to end up in a, a prison for drugs charges and I don't even have drugs or something like this, you know? Yes, and I'm starting to panic thinking, oh, have mm. I seen my bags at Glasgow and yeah. what is the grabbed my bag so I did I was like I knew it I asked the glass was you know they'll go right through and then I started thinking somebody picked them up in Dubai and done something mm. and then I got into the, the police station and the company I went to work for they had a a guy that picks you up a security guy that picks you up at the airport and takes you to the site so he followed us to this police station and I got to speak to him for like 30 seconds before they put me in a in the cell and he, he says don't worry Brian it's just a it's a Happens now and again, it's just a name thing. We we'll just need mm. to check the name. So they put me in this. I've got pictures of the Basra because I managed to keep my phone, but they put me in this holding cell in there. And I was like, oh my God. They took my shoes off me, took my watch, my ring, um, took everything off me pretty much there and then, eh? And put me in this cell. And then they came and seen me and took me out, sat me in the the, the chief's office and then started going on about Qatar. So I was open to them straight away. I said, oh, I worked in Qatar, yeah, 2016. I left at Christmas into 17 due to uh, uh, being unwell. And then they started talking about all oh, money, check. I says, I've never had a check. And I says, I, had, I took a loan. I says, and that most of that's paid back. I says, oh, but I'm still thinking to myself, that can't be a, a big problem like this. Then they start. Then it came apart, and it was something to do with that. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, "This, oh, this will get sorted out." If I need to spend the night, I spend the night. But uh, from there, for then on, it just well, it started spiraling out of control. Eh? And uh, they just put me in that cell. They obviously, they gave me my phone now and again in there. But um, I didn't realise until I got home that. The only reason I had my phone in there and the only reason I was getting food brought into me was a lot of money was exchanging hands, eh? Everything yeah, that I, you had to pay for everything. Everything. Mm. And uh, I'll not name the company, but they, they told me that in the time that I was in there, I think I was in there about 16, 17 days, they paid over $10,000 just to wow. get people to come in and give me food, allow me to get access to my phone now and again. The fact is that it was a company, so they, they, they were just naming their price. Eh? Sometimes they didn't let them in, if they depended how they felt, they felt. And anything that did get brought into me, I would speak to them on the phone and they'd be like, did you get your your juice? Did you get your book? Did you get this? And mm. nine times out of ten, half the stuff that they sent didn't they arrive. Took, didn't mm. arrive to me, eh? mm. didn't get to me. Um, <clears throat> And then I didn't know that was going on, and obviously that there was money exchanging hands, and then they're taking money off of me. I didn't have much money on me at the time for traveling mm. because I got told not to travel with a lot of money. I had a couple of hundred dollars by the time I'd been there about four days, that was gone as well, eh? Yeah. Just yeah. money, you want a phone, you need money, you want to have a shower. So, I mean, what were the conditions like overall? I mean, while you were there, they were described, you know, by you to to your brother as, you know, rat infested and, and rats in the water and, and this kind of thing. Was it, was it really bad in there? Basra, to be honest, when I got there at first was, I had one of these, well, it's just a hole in the ground, but it was like one of these uh, portals you have on a building site mm. that was hanging to bits in the corner of the cell. That was in Basra with a bucket in it that had a tap that you could put water in and that was what you had to shower in as well eh, over the top of the toilet yeah, I've seen okay. the pictures of them, I've got some pictures of that, it was oh, wow. okay, it was stinking, them. it was stinking and I was like I says, I, I, says, I started kind of kicking off a wee bit at the start saying I've done nothing wrong in this country yes. why am I being held in this conditions um they never let me out in Basra. They let me out once for about 10 minutes. Uh, it was roasting hot. It was infested with mosquitoes. I was getting bitten every single minute of the day with mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. 
the food that was coming in, by the time it got to me, I don't know where it had travelled from, but it was cold. I never had any warm food. Um, and the guards, I remember once, I never seen anybody for the best part of 48 hours, eh? Nobody even came near us, like, they just left us there and you're shouting and uh, your kids, mm-hmm. they're constantly on camera there and you're constantly, the light was never out for the day I arrived to the day I left, big bright mm-hmm. lights on you, so. How did you manage to sleep? To be honest, rather, for the first week, I've, I just, I maybe fell asleep for 10 minutes here and there. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot, I learned a lot about my own mind that I was in depths that I never thought I would be in in my life. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to give up here. Like, But I don't know where it came from. I, I managed to just, I think it was the hope that I hadn't even heard that 100% I would get out. And I hadn't even heard, I knew I was going to go to Qatar, but I just didn't know when. And I, I knew the World Cup was on. I said, I won't go anywhere until after that, eh? But I still had hope and bad that I was getting out because this then became, you need a lawyer. This mm-hmm. is the police telling me this. So I'm in panic mode and okay. And then it was this lawyer supposedly turns up and they, t- they take me out of the cell and they're all sitting there. Oh, would you like water? How my friends try to take, they're taking selfies of me with their cells in the police station, eh? Mm-hmm. And I'm like... I just felt like a, a trophy, eh? I'm like, what, what is this? And he says, you need to phone your family now, we need $30,000. And I'm just like, what? Oh, you won't get out unless you pay this $30,000. We'll take you to court in and you'll get out the next day. Mm. So that phone call was probably one of the worst ones, eh? Because I'd fought the first one phoning home to say that I was kind of arrested, but I was still, I'm going to get out here. But the, the one when I phoned to say that, they wanted thirty thousand dollars, and that I'm going to uh, Qatar if I don't pay it. I remember phoning, and they were all there. Eh? They made me phone in front of them, and I, I'm, my wife will tell you, I, I don't even think I cried at any of my kids being born. I'm a bit deep that way, eh? and I just I started bubbling like a, a child, like a baby. Eh? And I was just like, I don't know what to do. This is they asked me thirty thousand dollars now, or mm. so we went into this whole. Uh, I don't know, just grilling me con- consistently, eh? bringing me in and out of the cell into a room, not the, not the manager's room at this time, it was like the, the officer's room where they slept and just sat me on a bed, a chair while they sat in the bed, laughing and joking with each other. You better phone the family, we need the money now. So I, thought, I was phoning John, eh? and that was then I told John, listen, you need to be on the same page as me outside. I says, these guys are... They can't. They don't know what I'm saying to you. So to be honest with you, I, I didn't want to spend this money, but this is the situation. So anyway, <clears throat> long story short, you probably know, but my, my father was away trying to send the money. Now, if that was me, my father's a bit different than me. Eh? He he's quite thorough. I would have just been hitting buttons to try and send it to get the money, eh? and the money would have been gone. Uh, so anyway, it kind of delayed a wee bit. So the court date came in Bajra, and I thought, great, this is what I'll be waiting for him out as soon as I get in here. So they had on the handcuffs away to Bajra uh, court, uh, and it was quite a, a strange setup. Eh? There was people in the, the police car that weren't police officers, and I think they were all in it. To, in on it, to be honest, they were all getting a, a slice of the cake, I think, eh? and I'm like, mm-hmm. I just felt like, Useless area, I couldn't even do anything. Eh? I just felt uh, my life's in these guys' hands. And yeah. we, we went to court with this so called lawyer, uh, put me in front of this judge, asked my name. Okay, you have a problem in Qatar, you're going to Baghdad. And I looked to the lawyer, and the lawyer's like, Okay. And we went outside, and I, I, I kind of broke down. I was sh- no crying, I was shouting and swearing. I said, You're nothing but a a lion so and so, eh? I says, you told me you're and he's got his arm around me with his phone taking selfies outside the court. What? Me and really? yeah, I'm, I'm I'm looking at the ground, I says, you can get that camera out of my face. I says, I don't know what he was doing with that, eh? And then they, they bundled me in the back of this car in the boot of this pickup that had a wee like mm. baby seat. I think you'd put a toddler in. Mm. And uh, that was that was waiting to go to Baghdad, and then that was um, a whole other grilling session of 
weniger 5000 Dollar so für TGT Bagdad. Mm. I'm like, what? So they kept me in day after day, and then eventually I went down to 500 dollars. I just point blank refused. I said, I've got I mean, nothing that's left. quite appalling, isn't it? I mean, you've got no power over the situation, and yet you have to pay for it. I mean, it's incredible. What happens to the you know people who simply can't? Oh, exactly. And I've got a friend I met when I got to Baghdad, and I feel sorry. I'll, I'll touch on name A, but um, I was just like, I ended up saying that if I just keep giving in here, they, 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 would, they would have me sell my house. See, they were asking how much my house was worth and yeah. what my dad does for a job, what my brother does, what my wow. wife does. And I'm like, uh, I says, so I just gave in at the end. I says, look, I says, I've got nothing left. I says, mm. just leave me back in the cell. I says, yeah. if I'm not going, if I'm not going to Baghdad, I'm not going to Baghdad. And eventually, the comments says, oh, we're taking you for, for you're my friend, my goodwill in my heart. I'm going to take you to Baghdad myself. Mm. So as I, I left Basra, I went into the room where my bags were, and I remember them taking my watch and my wedding ring and everything off me, and I put it in this pocket in my bag, and I went straight in there and I looked at the guy because it was him that took it off me. Eh? And it went, my watch wasn't there, my wedding ring. I says, where's my watch? Went, oh, hey, friend, friend. I says, oh, that's, that's mine. Mm. I says, listen, the, the wedding ring means nothing to you. And I had Google Translator on my phone telling him this, and he's just laughing, eh? Mm. That was my wedding ring gone, my watch gone, never to be seen again, my trainers gone, T-shirts. Left me with my work clothes and an old pair of trainers. Gosh. So you were completely that, looted, basically. By the, yeah, by the time I left there, apart from being physically raped, and mentally I felt like that's what had been done to me. Yeah, I, says, mm. I just took everything that I possibly they could take off me. They'd done it. The Mentally, I, I just... Tortured mentally, eh? And, uh, mm -hmm. But to be honest, I felt a bit of relief that I was going to Baghdad. And I thought, here we go, it's a new chapter, I'll get out in Baghdad because that's where I had to go. They told me, we can't deal with Interpol in Basra. You need to go to yeah. Baghdad. Yeah. Uh, I got to Baghdad and that itself was... Um, I remember the first day arriving there in Baghdad... Uh, at the Ministry of Foreign, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. They took me to this roundabout and they met the Interpol police there. And then they put me in the back of this police car. And that was the Basra guys. They were gone then. But see, see when I got to Basra, to be honest, rather, there's loads to tell you. Hey, and I know these guys are coming out loving. And I don't want to miss everything out. But when I arrived in Basra... I'm only used to what goes on back home. I've never been in trouble back home, to be honest. I just watch TV like everybody else in newspapers. And uh, the thing is, I get to I get to Baghdad and the the stops at this hotel, and I'm like, "What stop me here for?" Type thing. They put handcuffs on me and take me to a hotel. Two rooms. I go in one room with a police officer, and he says, "Sit in the bed." I sat there for about an hour while the chief was in the room next door having a shower and getting changed mm. after the drive the seven hour drive to Baghdad, which was bizarre, stopping at service stations and they're joking and laughing and taking drums of diesel at the back of their, their police meet their car, filling up their car. I'm just like, what, what's going on here? Like mm. uh, and then she's right, we're going for breakfast. I says I did I didn't even want to eat anything else, so we sit, takes me to this wee place to get bre breakfast with them, taking pictures of me again, and I'm sat there, and this family comes in with two wee girls, eh, younger than my kids, but I remember me when they were younger, and I was just like, Phew. I says, I can't sit here, and he's like, what's wrong with you? I says, ah, it's just, that family's came in, and they're laughing, eh, and they're like, ah, oh, you might see your kids again, you might not, and I'm just like, oh, Wow, that, that's I mean that's torturous, isn't it? That's just horrendous yeah, that they treat people like that and laugh at them and mock them. Uh, and that, this whole I couldn't get my head around taking photos of me all the time, eh, and videos. Mm. And Gosh, that is weird. It, it's for their personal collection. I mean, that, that's such bizarre behaviour. And then I remember driving up. But it's like five in the morning there, so it's like two in the two three in the morning back home and. 
my my internet obviously my phone wasn't working. He says phone your wife. I says no, no. But he had my number from before this guard because they let me use his phone if I paid him money, obviously. Mm-hmm. But uh, he starts just phoning my wife at two in the morning, eh? And I'm in the back of this car in the pitch black. She can't see me. She's freaking out. Just woke up. And they're oh hi. They can't speak. Oh my goodness, that is so weird. And I'm just like, why, why are you phoning? I just, I'm shouting in the back, Kimberly, I'm fine, I'm nearly there, just hang up. So she hung up, but I knew that would be her up there, and, eh, thinking, what's going on, eh? And so they I were just, it, it seems like they were just having fun with you or fun with her. Exactly, exactly. Because even when I got home, Rada, and I spoke to Kimberly, she said, I never told you the whole time you were there, but that policeman was texting and phoning Kimberly at all hours of the night the whole time I was in jail, eh? What was he saying? Oh, I, Brian's my friend. Uh, oh, I, I see your picture. Can you send picture? And <gasps> I'm like, what's the Oh, picture? my goodness. <laughs> yeah, and I said to Kimberly, I says, I spoke to these guys daily, and to be blunt, and you're probably aware, rather, and I'm not being horrible when I say it, I would never speak like that, but they're only, they're only interested in two things, and it's money and treating women badly. Eh? Yep. And they openly tell me that. Mm. that. That the only two things in life that matter to them is money and basically abusing women, eh? Mm. And I'm like, and, and then Kimberly's telling me he's, he's, he's still trying to phone, he tries, still tries to phone me. And I'm like, just text him, tell him, don't phone this number again. But Kimberly lost. And, and sorry, they're still trying to contact her even after you've yep. you returned. Yep. That's incredible. Yep. Oh, my gosh. And next thing they'll be asking to send nudes or something like this. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> exactly what they're aiming at. I know for a fact they are. And I told Kimberly, wow. just to ignore them. But she's she's wanting this wedding ring back. And he's like, oh, Brian gave me it. He's my friend. What a lot of, just a lot of shit, eh? Oh, that, that is insane. I'm, I mean, they're just trying to add pain to your whole experience, hoping to get something to traumatise you with. Exactly. And then... Obviously, they dropped me off. They left at Baghdad, and um, they took me into this Interpol. Well, it looked like a derelict building, and then opened this office door, and it was pristine. And there's this guy, the usual. They, all, they were all the same: the suit, the open shirt, and the gelled mm-hmm. hair, and looking all perfect. But they thought they were so smart. Eh? They were just like, "Oh, you're safe now. You're with a proper organisation. You're not with Basra Police. You can tell us anything." Uh, you'll be out in two days' time. This is just a process we're going through. Uh, and I, I never really spoke to them. Eh? I just say, just take me where I'm going. So they, they put me in this car and took me to the uh, Babel Shack. Babel Shack, I think it was called uh, Station Stroke Prison uh, Holding Cell. And when I arrived there, I remember phoning Kimberly and they took you in this wee waiting room and you could see the TV screen and all the cameras that were in the cell and I managed to peek through and see and I'm just like, holy shit, I'm surely not going in there. Like, So I asked them, I said, am I, am I going in? Yeah, yeah, you're going in there. I said, I, I can't go in there. I could see just on the screens how filthy it looked and overcrowded, eh? And the lawyer was there at this time, Tasheen, and he says, don't worry, if I heard people say be patient once, I heard that a thousand times, eh? And I, tell, I started telling John and Kimberly, just don't use that word again, I says, because I'm just, I'm trying to be patient, but it's not happening, eh? So anyway, they, by this time, I've been slept in this whole car journey and all these, all this in my head. They opened this cell door and it was just like, in the movies, one of these Western bars where everybody swings around in their chair, eh? And I'm, there's this Western boy coming in. And I never even knew, and I had my trainers on at this time. I managed, I got my trainers to travel. And I walked in on the floor, and they, they kicked off straight away because I was standing on their sacred floor with my, my dirty shoe. Well, they call it dirty shoes, eh? So I took them off. They went in a bag. And uh, I sat. I just sat down in the middle, eh? This wee space on the floor, and I'm just like, shit. And they're coming up talking Arabic, and I'm just like... No Arabic, no Arabic. Mm. And uh, this guy got woken up, Hussein. This, this guy was my saviour, and this is who I wanted to try and help as well, eh? But he's Lebanese, and he could speak good English, and he says, Brian, 
come sit with us. They were all in, Interpol guys. There was six, seven of them. So they had their own wee gang. He says, you'll be okay with us. Just keep with us and we'll keep you right. And I'm just a rabbit in headlights on the first day. And mm-hmm. uh, it so happened that he was in for the exact same thing as me. And I says, okay, well, you've been here. He says, I'm on my eighth month, Brian. And I'm like, shit. And I told him all about Basra and his, he got arrested in Basra and he told me the exact same story. They said the same to him, the same process. And I thought, it's all just lies then. If they've told me that and they've told, mm. they made it out as if they were trying to help me, but they've told him the exact same stuff. You yes. need money to go to Baghdad and he thought they took all his money. Everything was the exact same. And I thought, shit. So I managed to get on a phone when the lawyer was there and I phoned John and my wife and says, listen, this guy's been here eight months. I haven't even mm. sent his paperwork yet. Mm. I says, I'm, I says, I, 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 I just gave up. And they said, no, and I think that's when they got in touch with you, Rada. They did, because I remember John telling me that you, you just told him that this uh, this um, Lebanese man had been there for eight, nine months. And I was I was telling him, don't freak out. We're still going to be able to get Brian home. Um, but it's really worrying when you see people on the exact same charges, you know, Qatar bank debt, and they're still there eight months later. Frightening. He, he's there eight months later, and his story just quickly tell you what he said to me, but there's more to it, and I want to obviously... I've got letters in my bag that he wrote begging me, and I promised him I would do what I could. He says, because if it wasn't for him, rather, it was bad enough, but if it wasn't for him, I don't know how I'd have managed, because I couldn't speak to anyone, eh? Yeah. Uh, and the guys were at me constantly, every two, five, ten minutes, poking me and talking to me, and <laughs> I, I never knew what, if he wasn't there to tell it, me what they were doing, you, you, I would you, yeah. out, eh? Absolutely. If you were alone or with people who didn't speak English at all, it just would have been so much more tra- traumatic. Yeah, exactly. And what he told me was, so his loan was for a wee bit more, but he was in Qatar for about twelve years working. Eh, mm-hmm. he had two kids born there. Uh, he took out, I think it was a seventy or eight, an eighty thousand pound loan, but he'd been paying it for years, and then he went back to Lebanon. Uh, when one of his kids was born and they decided he wasn't going back. Uh, but they got hold of him in Lebanon, being an Arabic country. Mm. They took his passport off him. They took him to trial in Lebanon four times, I think, or four or five times he went to court. They fined him $5,000 and gave him his passport back. He says he was free to travel. He got a job in Basra. Uh, he's in hospitality, the uh, restaurants and stuff so it was a restaurant manager job went to Basra exact same as me arrested so he still has good friends in Doha because he was there that long and he got in touch with one of them and says listen go to the bank it was it was Doha Bank not uh, the uh, QNB one Doha National Bank his friend went and he had something like $26,000 to pay so similar to what John did he managed to get money together money he had plus for friends and family and he sent his friend to the bank with the twenty six thousand mm. dollars uh that was left to pay and when he got there he says no no we want i think it was up to nearly a hundred thousand dollars eh? mm. and he's like no it's that's why he's left it no no he says yeah. charge charges interest uh, yeah, legal and, fees everything else yes and he's like well take this and let him out in Iraq and he can go and work. He says, we're not interested, leave him. Mm. And that since that day, he's had nothing. I've not sent his paperwork to Iraq to mm. see why he's there. Mm. Uh, he's got no 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 one listening to him. And his embassy's never even been in Sino, eh? They went once, way back at the start. And well, Lebanese in there, embassy is not the most atten- attentive, I have to say. <laughs> but I, I just feel so... I was obviously over the moon that I had the help for like see yourself and my family and everybody else that I got out eh? and I was so I was jumping about that cell like crazy when I was getting out but I felt really bad eh? yeah because he's been there that whole You're time leaving him behind me thinking mm. Brian and he grabbed me before I went out and he's like please please remember me he says I hope you don't just go out there and switch off and I've came back and I've been in touch with his wife and mm. briefly and. But I've not really done anything yet, and that's playing on my mind now, eh? I feel bad that well, see, I'm sitting at home and I know what he's going through, eh? And he's mm. went through so long, and 
every penny I had left in my pocket when I left, I gave to him. And basically, his wife Lebanon's on its knees now, eh? And it is. His family's broken. He's got nothing, eh? And he's at the stage mm. now. He says, Brian, I don't have what you have back home, eh? I don't have support like you. And mm. I even went in my my bag there just the other day. And he, I don't know how he managed it, but he's, he put a Lebanese bank note in there where I'm not on it saying your best friend has saying please remember me mm. eh? and I'm just like holy shit mm. but that Baghdad cell back home if you put three Alsatian dogs in there and left them in there you would have the RSPCA at your door eh? definitely and yeah. we had day to day running average of 30 five people in it but it peaked up to the 40s at times there was people coming and going all the time two three days but uh, I, I steadily went in the third, mid 30s eh? and the first week in there I was just like oh my god the very first night I was like where did I sleep they gave me this wee mattress these wee thin mattresses that was I was just itching looking at it this thing's just been lying in there for I don't know, probably years, it's all ripped and torn, give you a, it looked like a curtain, a set of curtains, and this mm. pillow that I was, I'm not putting my head on that, I <laughs> no. took it out of my bag and wrapped that around the pillow, and mm. the very first night, you're lying on the floor, again, the lights are shining on you, they had two of these big fans on the ceiling, I can still see them at night, I shut my eyes, and because of the light mm. flashing through them and the noise, it's just like, vroom, vroom. And the only time it was quiet was at night, and I'm lying there the first night, and I'm like, what's that? I could feel something running up inside my chest, eh? So I pulled the blanket back, and there's this thing the size of a, a credit card, if you like, cockroach up inside my teeth. Oh, no. I've jumped out this, off this bed shouting, and I'm throwing this thing off. And then oh. the wee guy next to me, oh, he just gets up and picks this thing up and laugh. They're all laughing. So I couldn't sleep. And I'm lying, I jump in, I had a hoodie in my bag, a pair of tracksuit bottoms, I put them on with socks over, like a winter's day <laughs> in the head. And he's looking at the look, cold, 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 cold. I'm like, I'm just trying to tell him, it's not a day we've been cold, eh? <laughs> it's stuff so you, you were trying to so cocoon yourself up so they couldn't get under your exactly clothes? That. I've got a picture I'll send you, and you can only see my eyes, and that was it, eh? <laughs> and uh, I couldn't sleep that night, and then I'm lying there about two or three in the morning, and I hear this rustling sound and I'm like what's that and what they've done all day all the food waste any waste at all just went in black bin liners just went, lay in the toilet mm. and I looked and I thought I could see something moving there and I thought well, I'm, I'm hallucinating because I'd been going that long without sleep and then I seen this rat run past there and I'm like holy shit this thing was the size of a cat mm, and I thought no, mm. surely no, but I'd been to the toilet and I'm like, where are these things coming from? Like, only the only thing comes up the toilet, mm. which was just a hole in the floor that, mm. if you've seen train spotting in the toilet scene on that, it was 10 times worse, eh? Wow. And then uh, I'm like that, and then next thing there's another, it was just rats everywhere. And I'm that's like, a, that's a, morning, appalling, that's absolutely appalling, I mean... To be honest, if I was at home and that happened, me and the wife and kids would be living at my mum and dad's till somebody yes. came and got rid of their ass. Absolutely, yes. And uh, it was weird. It was just another level. My head was like, for four nights, I watched these rats all night, never slept. And one thing I noticed is they never, ever came out of the toilet, eh? And the Hussein's like, ah, they don't come out of the toilet, Brian, because the food's in there. There's no need to come out. So I managed to get that in my head and I started living as if, oh, well, there's rats here living with us, it's fine. But they stored, there are two toilet, three toilet cubicles, uh, rather. Two of them was used for everybody. And when I, I don't want to put you off your lunch, but these toilets were, you know, the, the process, they go to the toilet and it was knee height all the way around the wall, splattered mm. everywhere. And I'm just, just like, my God, uh, the stunk to some that I can still smell it. But the end cubicle is where they decided they would store all the fresh water bottles, all the bread that came in, any veg that got brought in, all just hanging there in bags. And there's rat shit everywhere. 
Do you know, this is probably the worst condition that I've had a report on. And, you know, we deal all across the Middle East. This is definitely the worst one that we've heard about. The, 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 only, the only positive thing so far is that you don't appear to have been tortured. But, you know, apart from that, like the general conditions are just disgusting. Honestly, the, the conditions, and they told me, the, the Iraqis that I was speaking through a Hussein to were telling me, this is, mm -hmm. this is five star. You're lucky you're not the other one. Yes. And I'm like, yeah. holy sh what's the other one like? But oh, can you imagine the, in the in the villages? <laughs> well, there was no hot water the whole time I was there. The mm. shower head oh, it was like no, oh, like I remember my kids as bit toddlers, I've got runny noses, that's what was hanging for the shower head. Mm. It come out a brown colour. You mm. had a shower and came out the yeah. shower and all you done was itch for the next twenty four hours because I don't know what the water was. And then I realised why they guys obviously didn't wash for three weeks. I counted one guy 23 days without even picking up a bit of soap. Mm. Uh, because they come out dirtier. <laughs> oh, and oh. then the, the, the physical, uh, the mental torture every day, I just, it was just a noise. It was nothing that bar, just a noise of ra rattling voices and a fan and a, there was a generator right outside the the what the window that went outside well the, the opening that went outside and the fumes are coming in for the generator eh? and you're getting a sore head and then I seen I seen them uh, hitting other prisoners mm. the police I seen fights in there umpteen times kicking off but with the cameras. They had 30 seconds to get their fight over and done with. I was in two kind of scr scuffles with the same guy that had a bit of an issue with me. Uh, but I learned that Hussein told me, Brian, try not get into any fight. He said, you'll know why. Then about a week later, two guys were fighting and uh, they took them out. You can see through the two gates, the barred gates, but then there's a wee room at the side, that's where you got to make your phone calls at the weekends, you, that you got to make, mm. you heard them beating them up, eh? and they're squealing like, these are grown men, eh? one of them a lot bigger than me, squealing like pigs, again, and getting brought back to the cell, one of them had a hoodie on, and had his hoodie pulled right mm. over his head, with his hands behind his head, and the other one had his hands tied behind his back, and they just put, as I was asking her, saying that, what happened? They said, just take them in there, they tie them up, put them face down, and they just take shots, side, kicking them for feet yeah. up to the up to their chest. They don't hit their face, eh? So they, mm. they can't see any physical markings. But uh, I seen one of the police hit a guy in the face twice. I'm like, whoa, I'd slap him, but slap him like it took him off his feet, eh? Uh, then I was getting stories for them about ones that were in there on drug charges. Mm. Some of the stories were just like, they don't take them there first, they take them to this other, like the, the drug the police take them to another place and basically just torture them for 10 to 14 days, eh? Mm. I said, what do you mean torture? Like, and they, hand, they put their hand up, one hand there and one hand up the, back, the bottom, for the bottom up, for the other side and handcuff them that way. And then mm. they put them on a pulley this is what they're telling me, and Hussein says, Brian, uh, he says it is, it's, it's true. You put them on a pulley up to the ceiling and drop them, eh? Face down onto the ground. They tie their feet up, find lying face down on the ground, and they get like a garden hose. Yeah. A length of that, and they just keep beating their feet, soles of their feet. Mm. They had, like what you use for jump starting your car, onto certain parts of their body that uh, you wouldn't want anything put on, zapping them. Yeah. Told they could take no more, eh? See, that, that's put... quite a common one. That's common even in the UAE and, uh, and other prisons. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, yeah. Anything well, else? I was, I'm you... hearing these stories, rather, and I'm starting to think, oh, oh I'm, this is in my head thinking, is something going to happen to me? They were, they were heavy handed with me at times, like when they were taking me out of the cell and pushing, <laughs> constantly pushing you in the back when you're trying to walk in. I got outside twice and it was in a glorified dog cage, but a bit bigger, but 
it was half the size of the cell and there was another holding cell and they put us all in there at the same time to get exercise. You couldn't even walk once everybody was in there. Mm. And there's two two guards on the, on the top with AK-47s pointing through the, the bars on your head. And I'm like, what am I doing here? And then everybody's just coming up to me because I'm... I was like, I, said, I felt like saying, I mean, you've never seen somebody from anywhere else before in your life. Mm. But it was just like, what tattoos? This is what they're saying to his end. So I stopped going outside after that. I was there two times. I said, I'm not going out there. It was just... Too worrying. I, I just honestly, mm. brother, I don't know. I told you at the start, getting through it was the, the fact that I won't say no news is good news, eh? But as day, there were some days I remember phoning home and I was like, to John, I says, listen, I says, I'm just going to, I, I can't keep going. Like, I says, I told John one day, and Kimberly, stop telling me that we're going to hear something in three days' time. Yeah. I says, just, let's just go day by day because I would live for the three days, eh? Yeah. And I'd be strong for the three days, and then I'd get hit with a, the lawyers no went to court or... It's, it's and, and, almost and, better to wait until it's happened and then tell you after it's happened rather than telling you yeah. it's going to happen and then it gets delayed and everything and that's, you know, it's painful, it's more painful. Exactly, and it was just like, I'd stopped smoking for months before I went in there and I was straight back on cigarettes smoking. Oh, well, I, th I think yeah. the circumstances warrant that, no no question. Uh, <laughs> but uh, even the money in there, I was just like, when is this going to stop? Like, they were taking money mm. off me f every week for cleaning. Mm. Cleaning? It was us that cleaned it. <laughs> they were taking money off us every week for air conditioning that they only put on for an hour every three hours. They took money off me for electric. They took money. Every time I phoned, they were taking up to $20 off me to use WhatsApp. So you had to pay for them to keep on the lights all night. <laughs> yep. Yep. Every, pay for uh, mm. the air conditioning. If I wanted to use a phone, which they, was the guards that had a thing go. There was a guy inside, a prisoner inside that ran it with the guards outside. Mm. Uh, and for the first four or five days, they wouldn't told me I wasn't allowed to use the phone. As far as they were concerned and I was concerned, that phone never existed. Mm. No money changed hands. They were terrified that I'd tell anybody, eh? But I know I, start, I started getting wise to it. They were taking up to $20 off me and sometimes I'd speak for two minutes and they would just take the phone off me, eh? Switch it off. Wow. Mm. And I'm like, what? And then I seen the Iraqis giving them what was the equivalent of about one and a half dollars, eh? And they're on the phone for 20 minutes. Uh, I got out a couple of times into the police chief's office where I realised that he was just trying to get money off me constantly. He was taking mm. Tashin, my family had to give $500 once to come in just to see me for about three minutes. Mm. I, so I ended up saying to my family, don't send him back in, just use communicate with him because I was just, everything was just constant money. The embassy managed to get in a few times. They told me that the police chief says they wanted to come in every, at least once a week. He says you're getting in every two weeks, once every two weeks if you're lucky. Mm. They held, there was an Arabic guy for the embassy and I told Caroline at the embassy this, that she was brilliant. She was English, she was great. But the Arabic guy stayed back one day and I went to go to the cell and says, oh no, sit. And he started quizzing me with the police chief about money and family and how much money mm. everybody's got. And I'm like, I didn't expect that for the embassy, like, but he was Arabic, eh? and I've learned something that I would never, I can't trust another one of the people in my life, eh? And then they tell me, if they told me it was raining outside, I'd have to go and look. <laughs> Definitely after that experience, absolutely, <clears throat> yeah. But see, to be honest, rather... I mean, I, I look, I should... I should um, let you go now because you've got an interview in 10 minutes with the reporter yeah. and I don't want to take up your, I want to give you a time to rest before then. But what I should say is highlights. What was the best time and the absolute worst time of your whole experience? The best time was uh, the, the day that they shouted to say I was getting out. <laughs> that there was just, I was, I never even knew it was coming. Uh, and then after that was when that plane touched down at uh, Edinburgh Airport, eh? I knew I was <laughs> home. 
Mm. Obviously, getting home to my family and everybody, it's still, it's still a bit much. I can't even go to the shop for a pint of milk, eh? I don't want to see all my friends and stuff. It's just like what they've done for me. I should, I'm totally, totally thankful for it and kind of thank them enough and for yourself. Even took me a while to speak to yourself. And mm. I just, to see my friends and what they've done, it, you don't appreciate people as much until some of the shit as this has happened. Mm. Uh, but the worst time, the worst thing was um, the initial phone call back home to tell them that, by the way, I'm locked up here and I don't think I'm getting out, eh? Mm. <clears throat> and then the next bit after that was when I actually managed to get a whole day official paperwork and read the words, you're sentenced to two years in jail in Qatar in 2017 in your absence. Mm. Qatar are wanting you... Um, Sent basically sent extradited, and my world just fell apart. Hey, I'd already fixed in my head the phone call to Kimberly. Listen, just get on with life. I'm not going to be there. Hey, don't even bother coming out here to see me. I didn't want the kids coming out here. I basically just ripped myself off then. Hey? I mean, that's that's just disturbing to even think about. Um, so you at that point you thought that you were going to go back to Qatar and you'd be going straight to jail there. I did, and I just if that if that came, if they came that day to say that's what was happening to me instead of saying I was getting out, I would have just no, I would have, I would have survived. I'd imagine somehow, but back home I didn't want to drag my family through it all. Eh? I was just ready to tell them, listen. Hopefully, in two years' time, I'm out. I'll see you then, but don't be sitting up every night worrying about me. You can't. I was just going to, I already planned to tell Kimberly, listen, do what you need to do, eh? but just forget about me, like, until whatever. I told her when I got in there, it was weird, the press pause, the pause button on my life, eh? Mm. And when I got back out, I pressed play again, but I thought that pause button was going to be on a lot longer than what it was, because my life, I didn't belong in there, that wasn't the life to me, that was just... Mm a survival or an existency mm. and it's something that I don't want to remember again. That's why I pressed pause because I don't want to take anything for it. Eh? Mm. And uh, I know you called your mum as well and, and told her at the time. Um... Uh, it was it was weird. We had this group chat thing on in Basra and when I hit the button, they all answered. It was weird. Mm. They all seemed to answer at once and then I ended up just switching. I had to switch off but I says, this is not this is not a joke. I'm quite usually having jokes about stuff like that with my family, eh? And I say, this is not a joke. I say, this is what's happening. And I can still mm. see their faces, eh? And... Oh, you can imagine. <clears throat> you can imagine the tears that have been shed over the past couple of months just from everyone, from you. And, and yep. um, it's just, you know, to, to think that you're going to lose someone for two years or, or you to lose your family for two years or more because you, yep. you know you know with Qatar as soon as you've done the criminal sentence they won't let you go because you haven't paid back the debt yet so you could be stuck exactly. there indefinitely so it's well, a... that Hussein told me that he mm. says I says well at least if you he says send me to Qatar I says at least if you go you've done eight months he says no they'll start the two-year sentence when I get there eh? I says you're yes. kidding me on and then when I come out they'll still want the money and they'll yeah. keep me in Qatar I'm like well how is that's not even human no, How they'll you... keep you. They'll keep you in Qatar until you've paid up, paid back the debt. But they won't give you a working visa after you've served your prison sentence. So it just makes no sense whatsoever. Um, obviously, they need to reform the system. But anyway, look, I'll let you go now. And I mean that that's just like for me to hear it directly from you for the first time and in that detail. And I know there's a lot more that you still have to say. Oh, so nice. I don't. Yeah. I definitely want to continue talking, and hopefully we can help your friend uh, Hussein. Is it the Lebanese man? Yep, Hussein. Yeah. Okay. As you can hear, that's an absolute nightmare being detained anywhere in the Middle East, let alone on the basis of an Interpol red notice for debt. Now, this is something that's recurring. And once Brian settles in, we're going to take a full statement. And we want to make not only Interpol accountable, but also the British government, who has a duty of care to inform 
British citizens that they may be subject to an inter Interpol red notice if it's likely to be an abusive notice, if it's perhaps from Qatar or the UAE who are notorious for reporting people with small credit card debts and having them locked up unfairly abroad. It is a breach and a violation of Interpol's protocol. It shouldn't be happening. And the British government, by way of informing citizens if they may be subject to a notice, gives them the opportunity to check with Interpol. And if they are subject to a notice, to have it deleted and removed permanently before they travel in the future. Now, this would have prevented the unlawful and unfair detentions abroad of numerous British citizens. And we intend to work with Brian to lobby for that not to happen again. Kenning McCaskill is in full support of that, as is Douglas Chapman and various other members of Parliament. So we'll keep you updated on that. But it was wonderful to speak to Brian. It was an absolute pleasure, pleasure to help his family who were, who were just amazing throughout. And so, uh, so was the British ambassador to Qatar, very helpful. Douglas Chapman, also the uh, Qatar's ambassador to the UK, was nice enough to bring him in and speak to him about the case in person when he delivered a letter at the embassy. So this whole process has been, uh, from, from the moment we took on the case, it's only been a month in total for the family. It's been two months. It's a lot of trauma. It shouldn't have happened. You can't compensate someone for the experience he went through. As you as you heard him say, he was ringing up his family thinking that he's not going to see them again, that he's going to be sent to Qatar and jail for two months. I mean, this is, sorry, two years, maybe more. This is an unacceptable situation and he needs to be compensated. Thank you for listening to the Gulf Injustice podcast. Thank you for listening to the Gulf Injustice podcast.